The Lone Star Ranger, published in 1915 by Zane Gray. Narrated by T. Lee Productions. Chapter 1 So it was in him, then, an inherited fighting instinct, a driving intensity to kill. He was the last of the Duanes, that old fighting stock of Texas. But not the memory of his dead father, nor the pleading of his soft-voiced mother, nor the warning of this uncle who stood before him now, had brought to Buck Duane so much realization of the dark passionate strain in his blood. It was the recurrence, a hundredfold increase in power, of a strange emotion that for the last three years had arisen in him. Yes, Cal Bane's in town, full of bad whiskey and a hunting for you, repeated the elder man gravely. It's the second time, muttered Duane as if to himself. Son, you can't avoid a meeting. Leave town till Cal sobers up. He ain't got it in for you when he's not drinking. But what's he want me for? Demanded Dwayne. To insult me again? I won't stand that twice. He's got a fever that's rampant in Texas these days, my boy. He wants gunplay. If he meets you, he'll try to kill you. Here it stirred in Dwayne again. That bursting gush of blood, like a wind of flame shaking all his inner being and subsiding to leave him strangely chilled. Kill me? What for? Lord knows there ain't any reason. But what's that to do with most of the shooting these days? Didn't five cowboys over to Everest kill one another dead all because they got to jerking at a squirt among themselves? And Cal has no reason to love you. His girl was sweet on you. I quit when I found out she was his girl. I reckon she ain't quit. But never mind her or her reasons. Cal's here. Just drunk enough to be ugly. He's aching to kill somebody. He's one of them four flush gunfighters. He'd like to be thought bad. There's a lot of wild cowboys who are ambitious for a reputation. They talk about how quick they are on the draw. Ape Bland and Kingfisher and Hard and all the big outlaws. They make threats about jogging gangs along the Rio Grande. They laugh at the sheriffs and brag about how you fix up the rangers. Cal's sure not much for you to bother with if you only keep out of his way. You mean for me to run? asked Dwayne in scorn. I reckon I wouldn't put it that way. Just avoid him, Buck. I'm not afraid Cal will get to you if he met him down there in town. You've your father's eye and his slick hand with a gun. What I'm most afraid of is you'll kill Bane. Dwayne was silent, letting his uncle's unearthed words sink in, trying to realize their significance. If Texas ever recovers from that fool war and kills off these outlaws, why, a young man will have a lookout, went on the uncle. You're 23 now, and a powerful side of fine fella, barring your temper. You've a chance in life, but if you go gunfighting, if you kill a man, you're ruined. Then you'll kill another. It'll be the same old story, and the rangers would make you an outlaw. The rangers mean law and order for Texas. This even break business doesn't work with them. If you resist arrest, they'll kill you. If you submit to arrest, then you'll go to jail, and maybe you hang. I'd never hang, muttered Dwayne darkly. I reckon you wouldn't, replied the old man. You'd be like your father. He was ever ready to draw. Too ready. In times like these, with the Texas Rangers enforcing the law, your dad would have been driving to the river. And son, I'm afraid you're a chip off the old block. Can't you hold in, keep your temper, run away from trouble? Because it'll only result in you getting the worst of it in the end. Your father was killed in a street fight, and it was just told of him that he was shot twice after a bullet had passed through his heart. Think of the terrible nature of a man to be able to do that. If you have any such blood in you, never give it a chance. What you say is all very well, Uncle, returned Dwayne. But the only way out for me is to run, and I won't do it. Cal Bain and his outfit have already made me look like a coward. He says I'm afraid to come out and face him. A man simply can't stand that in this country. Besides, Cal will shoot me in the back someday if I didn't face him. Well, what are you going to do? inquired the elder man. I haven't decided. Yet. No, but you're coming to it mighty fast. That damn spell is working in you. You're different today. I remember how you used to be moody and lose your temper and talk wild. Never was much afraid of you back then. But now you're getting cool and quiet, and you think deep, and I don't like the look in your eye. It reminds me of your father. I wonder what Dad would say to me today if he were alive and here, said Dwayne. What do you think? What could you expect of a man who never wore a glove on his right hand for 20 years? Well, he'd hardly have said much. Dad never talked. 
but he would have done a lot. And I guess I'll go downtown and let Cal Bain find me. Then followed a long silence, during which Dwayne sat with downcast eyes, and the uncle appeared lost in sad thought of the future. Presently, he turned to Dwayne with an expression that denoted resignation, and yet a spirit which showed wherein they were of the same blood. You've got a fast horse, the fastest I know of in this country. After you meet Bane, hurry back home. I'll have a saddlebag packed for you and horse ready. With that, he turned on his heel and went into the house, leaving Dwayne to revolve in his mind his singular speech. Buck wondered presently if he shared his uncle's opinion of the result of a meeting between himself and Bane. His thoughts were vague, but on this instant of his final decision, when he had settled with himself that he would meet Bane, such a storm of passion assailed him that he felt as if he was being shaken with ague, yet it was all internal, inside his breast, for his hand was like a rock, and for all he could see, not a muscle above him quivered. He had no fear of Bane, or of any other man, but a vague fear of himself, of this strange force in him, made him ponder and shake his head. It was as if he had not all to say in this matter. There appeared to have been in him a reluctance to let himself go, and some voice, some spirit from a distance, something he was not accountable for, had compelled him. That hour Dwayne's life was like years of actual living, and in it he became a thoughtful man. He went into the house and buckled on his belt and gun. The gun was a Colt 45, six-shot and heavy, with an ivory handle. He had packed it on and off for five years. Before that, it had been used by his father. There were a number of notches fouled in the bulge of the ivory handle. This gun was the one his father had fired twice after being shot through the heart, and his hand had stiffened so tightly upon it in the death grip that his fingers had to be pried open. It had never been drawn upon any man since it had come into Dwayne's possession, but the cold, bright polish of the weapon showed how it had been used. Dwayne could draw it with inconceivable rapidity, and at twenty feet he could split a card pointing edgewise towards him. Dwayne wished to avoid meeting his mother. Fortunately, as he thought, she was away from home. He went out and down the path towards the gate. The air was full of fragrance of the blossoms and the melody of birds. Outside in the road, a neighbor woman stood talking to a countryman in a wagon. They spoke to him, and he heard, but he did not reply. Then he began to stride down the road toward the town. Wellston was a small town, but important in that unsettled part of the great state because it was a trade center of several hundred miles of territory. On the main street, there were perhaps 50 buildings, some brick, some frame, mostly adobe, and one-third of the lot and by far the most prosperous, were saloons. From the road, Duane turned into this street. It was a wide thoroughfare lined with hitching rails and saddled horses and vehicles of various kinds. Duane's eye ranged down the street, taking in all at a glance. Particular persons moving leisurely up and down. Not a cowboy in sight. Duane slackened his stride, and by the time he reached Soul White's place, which was the first saloon, he was walking slowly. Several people spoke to him and turned to look back after they had passed. He paused at the door of White's saloon, took a sharp survey of the interior, then stepped inside. The saloon was large and cool, full of men and noise and smoke. The noise ceased upon his entrance, and the silence ensuing presently broke to the clink of Mexican silver dollars at a monte table. Sol White, who was behind the bar, straightened up when he saw Duane. Then, without speaking, he bent over to rinse a glass. All eyes except those of the Mexican gamblers were turned upon Duane, and these glances were keen, speculative, questioning. These men knew Bane were looking for trouble. They probably had heard his boast. But what did Duane intend to do? Several of the cowboys and ranchers present exchanged glances. Duane had been weighed by unerring Texas instinct, by men who all packed guns. The boy was the son of his father. Whereupon they greeted him and returned to their drinks and cards. So White stood with his big red hands out upon the bar. He was a tall, raw-boned Texas with a long mustache waxed to the sharp points. Howdy, Buck, was his greeting to Duane. He spoke carelessly and averted his dark gaze for an instant. Howdy, Soul, replied Duane, slowly. Say, Soul, I hear there's a gent in town looking for me bad. Reckon there is, Buck, replied White. He came in here about an hour ago. Sure, he was some riled in the roaring for glory. Tell me confidential a certain party had given you a white silk scarf, and he was hell-bent on wearing it home spotted red. Anybody with him? Queried Duane. 
Bert and Sam Alcott, and a little cowpuncher I'd never seen before. They all was coaxed and trimmed to leave town, but he's looked on the floating glass, Buck, and he's here for keeps. Why doesn't Sheriff Oaks lock him up if he's that bad? Oaks went away with the Rangers. There's been another raid of Flourish Ranch. The Kingfisher Gang, likely. And so town's sure wide open. Dwayne stalked outdoors and faced down the street. He walked the whole length of the long block, meeting many people. Farmers, ranchers, clerks, merchants, Mexicans, cowboys, and women. It was a singular fact that when they turned to retrace his steps, the street was almost empty. He had not returned a hundred yards on his way when the street was wholly deserted. A few heads protruded from doors and around corners. That main street of Wellston saw some such situation every few days. If it was an instinct for Texans to fight, it was also instinctive for them to sense with remarkable quickness the signs of coming gunplay. Rumor could not fly so swiftly. In less than ten minutes, everybody who had been on the street or in the shops knew that Buck Duane had come forth to meet his enemy. Duane walked on. When he came to within fifty paces of the saloon, he swerved out in the middle of the street, stood there for a moment, then went ahead and back to the sidewalk. He passed on in this way the length of the block. Soul White was standing in the door of his saloon. Buck, I'm a tipping you off, he said, quick and low voiced. Cal Bain's over at Everell's. If he's hunting you as bad as he brags, he'll show there. Dwayne crossed the street and started down. Notwithstanding White's statement, Dwayne was wary and slow at every door. Nothing happened, and he traversed almost the whole length of the block without seeing a person. Everell's place was on the corner. Dwayne knew himself to be cold, steady. He was conscious of a strange fury that made him want to leap ahead. He seemed to long for this encounter more than anything he ever wanted. But, vivid as were his sensations, he felt as if in a dream. Before he reached Everell's, he heard loud voices, one of which was raised high. Then the short door swung outward as if impelled by a vigorous hand. A bow-legged cowboy wearing woolly chaps burst out upon the sidewalk. At sight of Dwayne, he seemed to bound into the air, and he uttered a savage roar. Dwayne stopped in his tracks at the outer edge of the sidewalk perhaps a dozen rods from Everill's door. If Bane was drunk, he did not show it in his movement. He swaggered forward, rapidly closing up the gap. Red, sweaty, disheveled, and hatless, his face distorted and expressive of the most malignant intent. He was a wild and sinister figure. He had already killed a man, and this showed in his demeanor. His hands were extended before him, the right hand a little lower than the left. At every step he bellowed his rancor, in speech mostly curses. Gradually, he slowed his walk, then halted. A good twenty-five paces separated the men. Won't nothing make you draw, you, he shouted fiercely. I'm waiting on you, Cal, replied Dwayne. Bane's right hand stiffened, moved. Dwayne threw his gun as a boy throws a ball underhand, a draw his father had taught him. He pulled twice, his shots almost as one. Bane's big bolt boomed while it was pointing downward and he was falling. His bullet scattered dust and gravel at Dwayne's feet. He fell loosely, without contortion. In a flash, all was reality for Dwayne. He went forward and held his gun ready for the slightest movement on the part of Bane. But Bane lay upon his back, and all that moved were his breast and his eyes. How strangely the red had left his face, and also the distortion. The devil had showed and Bane was gone. He was sober and conscious. He tried to speak, but failed. His eyes expressed something pitifully human. They changed. Rolled, set blankly. Dwayne drew a deep breath and sheathed his gun. He felt calm and cool, glad the fray was over. One violent expression burst from him. The fool! When he looked up and there were men around him. Plum center, said one. Another, a cowboy who evidently had just left the gambling table, leaned down and pulled open Bane's shirt. He had the ace of spades in his hand. He laid it on Bane's breast and the black figure on the card covered the two bullet holes just over Bane's heart. Dwayne wheeled and hurried away. He heard another man say, Reckon Kyle got what he deserved. Buck Dwayne's first gunplay, like father, like son. <laughs>